friends, after recovering from the youth session last night or this morning, I found my way going over to breakfast with two dear Baha'i friends, and one of them turned to me and said, I can't wait what the chairman's going to say about Milton Matahede. <laughs> and uh, at that point I said, well, me too. <laughs> Milt is a woman, a Baha'i, of no mean accomplishments. And uh, I will not go over the facts that you already know about her. As this Baha'i said, as we cross the street, I eat from Matahede plates when we have fine guests. And we know of her work for the Matahede Foundation and elsewhere. This is a woman who can do things by the power of God. And I'm just reminded of one vignette. Uh, when in the 1940s, America was given the task of selling pioneers in South America, there was a woman who went to Paraguay from Lima, Ohio. She survived six revolutions during 18 months. At the end of 18 months, this woman fell ill. And ah, she was being carried to the freighter that would carry her down the river to Argentina on a stretcher. The first Baha'is grouped around her said, please don't leave us, baby Baha'is. She had to leave. She was dying. And then she had this very difficult trip back to the United States, to New York. The woman who was responsible for saving her life for organizing a quick order, an ambulance, the right doctors, the personnel, the resources, was no one but Milton Matahede. And as this vignette, to me, illustrates the kind of Baha'i that's about to give a presentation this morning to us. Her presentation is interweaving themes of world culture, past, present, and future. Milton, please. get to be 80, it gets a little difficult. <coughs> Friends, I'm going to tell you something. Nothing gives you perspective like being 80. You find out what's important and what's unimportant. And having spent my entire life in realms of the arts, I now can try to look back and see what was important, what was, what is, and what will be. And how did it all happen? As it happens, that I travel about five and a half months a year. I've been 14 times around the world, about 300 times to Europe etc., etc. This is not boasting. This is to give you the point of view. Thank you. One of the most enlightening experiences I've had was being on a plane from Nairobi to Rome. And there was a woman sitting next to me who started uh, talking to me. What do you do uh, when you are flying 11 hours? Of course you talk to each other, whether you want to or not. And... Uh, Sometimes you really don't, but <laughs> she was from uh, the Rockefeller Foundation who were doing investigations about people's similarities and differences around the world. And she had been to many, many cities. And she discovered a very interesting fact which has stuck with me all these years. 
It doesn't make any difference whether it's an African village or it's the city of New York or Paris or a little tiny town out the west of the United States or Canada. Population divides itself the same. 10% are leaders, 90% are followers. This applies everywhere. Now, it's those 10% of people who are responsible for making changes in the world. What has given us a world culture? Number one, man's curiosity. What is there on the other side of the hill? I have to know. I have to know. And so he wanders and wanders all over the face of the earth. The recent theories are, and so much for racists, that man began in Africa. Some of you have seen that series of articles that came out. Man began in Africa. That may or may not be true. We're still digging in the Earth's surface. But never mind, it is one race. After all, you never heard of an elephant uh, marrying a snake. But any human being in any part of the world can marry or mate with somebody in any other part of the world and have children. Right. One race. So whether they first wandered out from Africa or where they wandered, they continued to wander all over the face of the earth. What were they looking for? Food. They were looking to trade what they had for what they needed. They were looking for uh, understanding of how they could take care of themselves physically. And they began to soon wonder, who am I? What am I? I'm not an animal like the other animals. I'm different. Who am I? And they began to think. And they began to make pictures. Believe me, I can assure you scientifically, the sun was round then as it is now. And they drew on the world of, on the walls of caves. And they drew all over on rocks what they were seeing and thinking and looking for. And they have left us much evidence of their discoveries. We find images, symbols, and there is a universal currency of exchange of symbols. They were deeply affected by interchange. They themselves did not realize it. It was a world in which very few people were literate and very few people were leaders and they did not really understand how things happened. They just groped along. Let me give you an example. Alexander the Great, as you know, conquered India. On his way, he went through Iran and all of you Persians who have blonde and red heads, uh, you should know that that's the kindness of the Persian women to the Greek army. <laughs> this is true. Now, when they got to India, and Alexander conquered India, he looked at their sculpture, which was then Pali sculpture, very severe and straight. And he said, this is awful. I don't like this. So he brought sculptors and potters from Greece and took them to India and said, teach them how to do it. So they did. And 
in the 6th century, when the Chinese came to uh, India to find Buddha, they had the vision that this prophet had come, and so they went to India. Well, they found Buddha with flowing Greek robes and with a head like the head of Apollo. And so all the Gandhara heads of Buddha looked like the heads of Apollo. Simple exchange. And all of the drapery that you see in Chinese art came from the teaching of the Greeks to the Indians and sweeping across to China. There is no such thing as purely Western art, purely Chinese art. There is no such thing. Everything is an interchange. And everybody is affected by it. And if you think that's any different for our continent, you're wrong. I was talking to Liang Yufan, the American, I mean the Chinese ambassador to the United Nations. And he said, uh, I said, do you know Liang? They have found out that in the 6th century, the Chinese came to the west coast of America. Oh, no, he said, that's wrong. In the 2nd century B.C., there are records in monasteries in western China of voyages to the west, or to the west coast of, of South and North America. And this account, for the fact that when you go to Ecuador, you think you're in some province of Mongolia. I've been there two, three times. Or, and it also accounts for the fact that the blood types are the same. Interesting. Very strange. We are, indeed, one world. And uh, we see between the Chinese, for instance, and the Incas, the exchange of culture. I can show you, I have in my collection, 2nd to 3rd millennium B.C. Chinese pottery that looks like Inca pottery. People come in and say, oh, you have American Indian pottery. I say, no, not American Indian Chinese, second to third century B.C., 5,000 years old. Now, what did man develop as he wandered around? What was he thinking about? What was he doing? Well, first of all, he had to take care of himself. Number one, food. You know, when it comes to lunchtime, you know how important that is. Food. And so, what to do? Well, have you ever tried eating out of your hands? You know, all those fingers that separate and leak everything out? Tough, isn't it? <coughs> so, what do you do? How can I overcome this? In some cases, they used leaves. Well, oh, not quite satisfactory. Then they discovered that clay hardened in the sun could be very, very good. And so little by little, clay began to assume a great importance in life. They began uh, first to make cups. And this was all over the world. We are one race. And when you start to think I mean, if you put two things together, they're always two, aren't they? Whether you're a Chinese or an American or a Canadian or whatever. Well, they had, they could stay, uh, see by logic that if you did certain things, you would get something to eat and drink from. Okay. Uh, why did the Chinese invent porcelain? Because they didn't have big mineral mines. Man does with what he has. In the West, in Europe, for instance, they had tin, and they poisoned themselves very well. 
And you know that the average uh, length of life was between 35 and 40 years. And now we know a lot of that was tin poisoning. Of course, you were a king. You could have gold and silver cups, and you'd last a little longer. Uh, but uh, the Chinese did not have a wealth of metals. And so they started in with this clay. And they discovered in the 2nd century B.C. that if you added to Tunsi or Galen, to this clay, and you put it over a fire, you had porcelain. Second century B.C. And I have my own collection, two pieces of this. Not beautiful, because they had not yet learned to glaze. But sure, her hold something. And uh, it has uh, zero absorbability. That's what they were looking for. Something to get, take care of the food needs of man. From that flowered a tremendous art by the 6th century. They had already learned how to glaze, and they began to experiment with colors. And their work was so beautiful that these nomads, going back and forth over the Silk Route across Asia, began to carry porcelain as a precious cargo along with silk. And you find a piece of second century porcelain in the Vatican. Seventh century, excuse me. Seventh century porcelain. It is found as far as Egypt. And you, they, of course, in Turkey. Now, let's come to that part of it. How did this all spread around? Well, you know, it's only in the 20th century we're talking about peace. Up till now, to be a warrior was the greatest honor. The more people you killed, the tougher you were, the nicer you were. And so, you know, we admired soldiers for thousands of years and warriors. Well, Genghis Khan, the Mongol, he decided he was going to conquer the world. And he came to Iran as he went across uh, Asia. And he had many Persians, of course, at his court. Uh, he noticed that some of these Persians had pottery that was painted in, in a beautiful cobalt blue. And he said, where do you get that color? And they said, from a mine that we have. He said, bring me some of that powder. He sent it to China. And in the time of Genghis Khan, at the end of the 14th century, the first piece of blue and white was made. Uh, the, the real cobalt blue was used only for the very upper class, and they used the lower grade, of course, for the lower class. Not that it wasn't as, uh, as good for holding food, but it wasn't as beautiful. And I might add, as a footnote, our world culture also includes world language. As Genghis Khan went across, uh, he, he went up Europe, and you know, he went as far as Finland. And the Mongol words remain in Turkish, in Hungarian, and in Finnish. If you count in Finnish, I have a Finnish cook, so I know how to count. Finnish, Ixi, Coxi, Coleman, and Visi. Those are the words of the Mongols. Uh, and you, you see the different characteristics in these different countries, the high cheekbones of the fin Finnish people. If anybody thinks he's a separate race or a superior race, forget it. He's just deluding himself. We are one. And we see that the interchange, for instance, the development of porcelain is a great thing, and I will come back to it, but I want to tell you about another thing. Who invented bronze? Those Persians. They invented bronze in the Middle East. And they carried it across to China. And I have in my collection a bowl, uh, which is uh, 7th century, 
which is ma made of pottery and is a copy of a Sasanian bronze. You can see that the themes of culture were weaving a new fabric. And this interchange continued and continued. Porcelain especially became a desired art. Uh, they, if you, any of you have been to Turkey and been to Topkapu, and that's how they pronounce it, not Topkapi, uh, <laughs> they have piles and piles of plates, big plates like that, which they used for eating in the court. And they believed that the Saladon would show if there was poison in the food. And so you see huge piles of celadon plates, very necessary to keeping the upper class in its place. <laughs> uh, now, the people in Europe realized that there was a culture that was only being reached through the Silk Route. And you know that Marco Polo went there it's the 13th century, and stayed for several years. And when he came back, he told all the wonders that he saw in China. And the Chinese labeled, I mean the Italians called it the million lies. And to this day, if, you, if somebody thinks you're telling a lie in Italy, they say, oh, i milioni. The million lies, they could not believe it. The, and, of course, don't think it was all one-sided. There were things going both ways. But, arriving at modern days, there was this curiosity of man. The Portuguese invented the caravel. And they decided that what that the caravel was the ship that brought over Columbus. You know, we're celebrating 500 years in 1992, a significant year in many ways. Uh, these carabels decided that they could go around Africa and come up and come to China. And so they were thinking, what can they do? What can they exchange with the natives for food and water? Because this was going to take many months. So what they, they thought and they thought, they thought, we can't give them our money, where are they going to spend it in the jungle? So they finally came up with an idea. Little tiny glass beads from a place called the Conteria in, uh, in, in Venice. It's a little island, Murano. It still exists. I've been to the Conteria many times. And they took the Conteria beads in barrels from Venice on the boats, and they went around Africa. And they left in each place beads and a few people. And that's how the whole colonialism of Africa was started. And to this day, if you travel around Africa, you will see these little Contaria beads. They're still making belts out of them. They're still have flat things around the neck with a plaque, I am lonely, won't somebody come to see me, with writing on it, or I am happily married and I have three children, or uh, I need a husband. Uh, you know, they wear these flat necklaces and then this tab. And uh, <laughs> this was the spread of the bead culture which actually started colonialism. And that brought into the West also not only the art of the Orient, but the appreciation for much of the art of Africa. This could go on for another several hours. I have pages and pages of notes. But what I think, as the program must continue, I think I must go a little faster. Uh, Man not only looked for his necessities, like clothing 
and places to live, which gave birth, places to live gave birth to architecture, started with a tree and ended with a skyscraper. Uh, clothing, uh, the million variations of clothing you can see around you today. When I was a little girl, you only wore blue jeans if you were a workman and couldn't afford it and it couldn't afford anything else. Now you must wear the most ragged ones you can to show that you don't care. <laughs> we are going through an evolution, a difficult evolution. And we are now searching, searching hard. Here we have all these arts from all over the world, these thoughts from all over the world. We should remember that even though they didn't have Concords and other kinds of airplanes, people wandered around looking for ideas. In the court of Chang'an, there were, at second century, 5,000 Nestorian Christians. We have, for instance, I don't know why they chose them for that, but uh, all the eunuchs at the court of the emperor were Muslim. Uh, so you had all the Arabic ideas, and you had the Arabs who went all over and brought ideas and things from one place, place to another. What do we have? What do we have now? We have such an amalgam that we don't know where we're going or what we're doing. That is the truth. I'll tell you, in my business, and I'm in touch with many parts of the world, we see all of a sudden, in this confusion, a desire to find meaning, meaning, meaning. And what do they start with? All right, let's go th to things we definitely know. <clears throat> and there is now a sharp return to Greek and Roman and to other early civilizations in design and in thought. Let's try to find the truth. You know that art has become such that a man stands in front of a canvas and he goes, tu, 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 tu. and this means, I don't know what it means, but the, but the curators will stand there for 45 minutes and explain it to you. <clears throat> I went with a group of very distinguished collectors to Washington, and they wanted to show us one of the museums there. I'll be good and not mention the name of the museum. <laughs> and uh, we were all collectors of Chinese and Japanese and other Asiatic arts. And the curator came out and said, this is a painting by, and it was just a big black panel. And one of the most distinguished collectors said, don't bother to explain it. It's just a sheet of black. <laughs> what they are showing now in art is, I should say, a psychiatric search for meaning. <laughs> and there is beginning to be a revolt against it. People say, when they see a picture now, they can tell whether it's a man or a woman that has scenery and someone. Thank God, I don't need to have somebody explain it to me for 45 minutes. I can see what it is. What is coming? What is coming? The Baha'i faith is the first to align arts and sciences. The first. And they will supplement each other. And we will give birth 
to a new kind of universal art. We are now one world. I have flown from New York to London in two hours and 55 minutes. We had a good tailwind, I might tell you, but it was two hours and 55 minutes. This is one world. When I want to tell my office in Lisbon that I don't like the way the curve is on so-and-so, I put it in the fax machine. They have it right away. Science, the servant of art. And science and art bringing reason and emotion together. And the search for the verities. Nature will remain as long as we remain, because we are part of nature. Our hopes, our ambitions, our emotions will change because we are now a world culture. What's coming, you can just see the beginnings. You can see a world understanding of each other's arts, of each other's thinking. And from these differences, and from their likenesses, because we are all men and women producing all of these arts, will come a new culture. Thank you.